a useful bucket bench is today's project on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. The Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services. Common sense internet marketing and web design. Our internet marketing commissions are based on results. Robinson and Mackle, thinking business, practicing law. Waterlock's unique tongue oil and resin blend stains, sealers, and finishes. The go-to finish for wood enthusiasts since 1910. The Appalachian area is comprised of 13 eastern states covering 205,000 square miles of rugged, mountainous terrain. It stretches from New York to Mississippi, with West Virginia being the only state totally encased in the area. When this region was first settled, the immigrants had to travel over the Appalachian mountain range with only what they could carry or haul by wagons. They would make furniture and other wooden items that were necessary and functional. Appalachian children and adults had plenty of chores to do throughout the day. The mother took care of the household, the father worked in the fields or worked in the mines. The children attended younger siblings, fed the livestock, gathered eggs, and often carried water to the house, either from a stream or a well. Obtaining water was an ongoing task, and to make it a little easier, there often was a bucket bench on the porch to deposit the full buckets and store the empty ones. Most bucket benches were 100% utilitarian. Rough lumber harvested on the farm was nailed together with cut nails to make a crude bench, large enough to hold a couple of buckets. Some bucket benches, however, were more refined with separate shelves for full and empty buckets. I'm in Putnam County, West Virginia, on a very old homestead, an old farm, and you can see this one is empty. It was only a few short generations ago that a lot of homesteads were much like this one. They did not have indoor plumbing. So they had to get their water from an exterior source. And in the Appalachian area, there was five exterior sources of water. They would have a, a well, it could be a hand dug well or a drilled well with a hand pump, where they could have a running creek or stream or river nearby. Uh, another option would be a lake, a pond or a reservoir. And the fourth would be to catch the water as it comes off of the roof of the house or the barn or the cellar and divert that to a wooden bucket or an underground uh, cistern. And the fifth and the, the most preferred type of water would be a spring. In the Appalachian area with the uh, rugged mountainous terrain, there were a lot of springs. So when they would find one, they would drive a pipe back into the ground where the water would be seeping out and extend the pipe out beyond the ground and put a wooden trough or a tub underneath it to catch the water. So it didn't matter which of these five sources of water they would use, they would have to carry them from the source to the house. And that would be a daily activity or a chore that would be given to the young people in the family because the older ones had more important chores in order to survive the harsh elements of the Appalachian lifestyle. So they would put the buckets on a designated place and that would be called a bucket bench. And here's an example of three different types of bucket benches. Now this is one that I put together using some reclaimed wood and some nice hardwood, some cut nails. This is typical of construction of a, of a bucket bench from several generations ago. Here's my rendition of a modern bucket bench. I've got some nice five quarter walnut on top, and then I've got some eight quarter uh, ambrosia maple for the legs and the stretchers are walnut also. This is very similar to just cherry and ambrosia maple. These are nice. There's no mechanical fasteners in those. Here is another style of bucket bench. This is referred to as a case bucket bench. 
And as you can see, there's multiple shelves. And what's unique about these is the shelves diminish in depth as you come up the case. The buckets of water would be placed on the bottom shelf. The upper shelves would hold whatever accessories were needed in order to use that water. So it could be a ladle or a bar of soap or a rag. Now over here is another style. This is referred to as a working bucket bench. And as you can see, there's a place down below to put the buckets of water. And up here at an elevated height is a well. And this is where they would actually perform the tasks such as cleaning vegetables or preparing the meal. So all three of these types of bucket benches were common in the Appalachian area. So if you want to see how to build one of these bucket benches, let's go back to the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop and I'll show you how to build one. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery in your shop. You need to know the safe way to operate your equipment. Make certain you have the proper safety equipment, and most importantly, use your PPE. Be safe and enjoy your shop time. Now, I'd like to go over some of the design features of the bucket bench. Now, if you remember, there are three types of bucket bench. This is the first generation or primary type of bucket bench, and this is the one that the name bucket bench is derived from. Historically, this would have been made with four legs, two on each side, or a large board on each side for a leg. Now, when there is one board for a leg, there is a cutout at the bottom, either an arc, a square, or a sharp triangle. And there's a reason for that. It is less likely to wobble if you have four feet, two on each side, as opposed to one long foot. Because if the surface that it's setting on is slightly out of flat, with a long flat surface, it'll rock. With four feet, it's less likely to rock. So what I'd like to do is go over some of the construction methods that I used for this particular bucket bench. Let's start with the legs. If you notice, the legs are splayed out uh, three degrees. That is to ensure that it is stout and will not rack. The leg is attached to the top with a loose mortise and tenon joinery. Now that is a very old joint, but there is a machine that has been manufactured recently that is used just for loose mortise and tenon, and that's called a domino, and I'll show you how to do that. And remember, with this splayed out at three degrees, you've got to account for that. So bo both mortises have to be three degrees and line up perfectly, and I'll show you how to do that. The stretcher down here is used to ensure that the feet do not wobble, and if you notice, they protrude beyond the end of the leg about three-eighths of an inch, and there's a reason for that. When these were made uh, by our uh, forefathers several generations ago, a lot of times they just nailed it together. If this was cut flush with the end of the leg and a nail driven in there, there's a very good chance that over time it would split. So they would allow this to protrude out beyond the edge so it minimizes the opportunity for that to split. And that's a nice little detail, and I carried that through on this design. I like that feature. Now the stretcher sets into a dado, and that could easily be done with a handsaw, a marking gauge, and a chisel but I'll show you how to do it with the machine. I'll, I'll show you how to do that at the table saw. Very easy to do, but remember, it is at a three degree angle, so we've gotta take care to get that right. The seat support right here, if you notice, the end of it is rounded over. That's to give it a more refined look. Now the seat support sets into a rabbit. Now a rabbit can easily be done with just a hand saw and a marking gauge but I'll show you how to do that with machines, 
and I'll be using the table saw and the band saw to do that. And remember, it's splayed at three degrees, so we've got to get that angle right. The top, if you notice, is rounded over on the ends. That's to give it a more refined look. And of course, the top is attached to the legs using a loose mortise and tenon joinery. And it is attached to the seat supports with just a little bit of glue. The next one I'm going to build, I'll be using some ambrosia maple for the legs. And I'll be using some nice clear walnut for the top. So let's take these boards over to the joiner and planer and I'll show you how I dimension these. Okay, this piece of ambrosia maple, which will be one of the legs for the bucket bench, is too wide to go across my 10 inch joiner. So I took it to the bandsaw and ripped it. And now I can run half of it through the joiner to give me a good flat surface. Now you can see the beautiful ambrosia maple. After joining the two pieces, I glue them together. Then I run them through the planer to get a good smooth surface. Okay, I've got the legs dimensioned to the correct thickness and the correct width. I will be attaching the top to the legs using a loose tenon. So what I'm going to do is cut a mortise in the uh, top of the leg and I'm going to use a domino cutter and the domino is the loose tenon. So I've already got it marked and now it's just a matter of cutting it. Line up to my mark. Okay, now I'm at the large bandsaw. I've used the top apron to set the distance from the blade to my fence. And now I'm just gonna cut out the small piece there. I've got to cut a dado in the leg for the apron. So I'm using the apron to set the height of the blade. And then I used a bevel square to set my miter gauge at three degrees. Now I've marked where, I've marked where the cut should be. And I brought my fence in and lined it up. Now this is the only time that it is safe to use the fence and the miter gauge at the same time. This is not a through cut. This is a cut just to mark the uh, bottom of the dado at the correct depth. So let's give it a try. Okay, now I've cut a groove in the legs for the bottom apron. And now I'm going to remove all the waste with the dado blade. So after cleaning it up with the chisel, then you can see the apron fits in there real good. I want to show you when you're going to make a sharp turn, a contour cut on the bandsaw, it's easiest if you make some relief cuts. And I'm going to show you now what the relief cuts are. 
Okay, now I've cut the contour. I need to take this over to the oscillating spindle sander and clean that up. Okay, I just finished sanding the inside of the curve here with my oscillating sander. So now I've got to do the other one. I've already face jointed and planed the top to the correct thickness and now I'm edge joining the edge and then I'll rip it to the correct width. So now I'm ready to install the legs. I wanted to show you how I do that. I've got the bench turned upside down. And remember, these legs are splayed out three degrees, so they can only go one way. So what I do is I go ahead and position the leg where I want it. And then I took the cutoff piece, which still had the three degree angle on it, and set it tight against the leg, and then clamp it in place. Now I've got my marks. Now to set my fence on the domino cutter, I'm going to set it on the bottom of the bench, loosen the angle, tilt it back until it rests against my fence, which is my cutoff of the leg, and then tighten it down. And now I'm ready to cut my slot. Just need to line it up with the mark. Okay, I've already gone ahead and contoured the seat support and I've cut the stretchers at an 87 degree angle. I've rounded over the top of the seat with a quarter inch round over and all the other edges have been rounded over with an eighth of an inch round over. I've dry assembled it and put the clamps on it to make sure everything fits right and that uh, the joinery is good and tight. So now I'm ready to disassemble it and glue it together. Now I'm going to apply glue liberally and I'll be spreading it around with a brush. I like to have a wet rag handy. So if I get any glue on the exposed surface, I can wipe it up immediately. That will also get the surface wet. So any glue squeeze out is not going to be an issue. To get a good bond, you got to put glue on all your mating edges. And you got to make sure you get glue on your loose tenons. Now I can put my seat supports on. You need to take your time when you're gluing the pieces together. 
make sure they're aligned properly. And I always like to wipe off any glue that is squeezed out. Glue is a lubricant before it is an adhesive. So when you apply clamping pressure, you need to make certain the boards do not slide out of alignment. So it takes a little bit of time to ensure that the clamping pressure is properly applied. You need to make certain that the top of the bucket bench is secured to the legs and you do that by clamping from the top and here I've got a call to ensure the top of the bucket bench is not marred and it's clamped directly to the workbench. Okay now I've removed all of the clamps and now what I'm going to do is take my little uh, trim router with an eighth of an inch round over and round over the edge of the seat support and the stretchers. I didn't do that earlier because I didn't want to round over where they would fit into the uh, joinery. Now I'll do that to the other side and to the bottom and a little bit of hand sanding and then it'll be ready for a finish. Okay, I've removed all the clamps. I've done a little bit of hand sanding to remove any clamp marks, made sure there wasn't any glue squeeze out anywhere. Now what I've done is put down a little bit of uh, craft paper on top of my workbench, turn this upside down because I like starting with the inside and working out. And what I have is an oil varnish blend and I'm going to apply that and when you do this I like to use a rag you can use a, a brush or even a foam brush but I like to use a rag and what you want to do is literally just flood it get as much on air as you can and let it soak in and I like doing the bottoms first these end grain will soak in a lot so I want to get it as much as I can and let it soak in. And then I'll get the bottoms of the stretchers and the inside. It's a very easy finish to use. It's not a very protective finish, but the good thing about it is if you have a scratch or something on it, you can just sand it and reapply the finish and it'll blend right in. Okay, now what I need to do is let this set for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'll take a rag and wipe up any excess. If there's any places that it's all soaked in, I'll give it a little bit more. And then just clean it up and let it dry. 
Hope you enjoyed this episode featuring the bucket bench. In future episodes, I'll be highlighting a specific piece of furniture or a wooden item that was utilized in the Appalachian area for a specific task. Because that task is no longer performed, then that piece of furniture or that wooden item is no longer made and no longer utilized. So come back to the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop where you'll learn more about some of the relics from the past. Enjoy 12 more woodworking projects in this season of the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. Using wood species native to Appalachia, learn how to make interesting wooden pieces based on antique pieces. Traditional joinery, like hand-cut dovetails, complement modern joinery techniques. Featured items include a schoolmaster's bookcase, a handy dry sink, a challenging wash stand, and a fun checkerboard project, among others. If you're interested in any information or plans on any of the items featured on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, just check out our website, AppalachianHeritageWoodshop.com. Remember, be proud of your Appalachian heritage. Mm -hmm.